Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members of Parliament, on the authority of His Excellency, the President, Nana Adodanka Akufuado, I beg to move that this August House approves the financial policy of the Government of Ghana for the year ending 31st December 2020. Mr. Speaker, on the authority of His Excellency the President, and in keeping with the requirements of Article 179 of the 192 of the 1992 Constitutional Republic of Ghana, and, and Section 21.3 of the PFM Act 2016, Act 921, may I respectfully, Mr. Speaker, present the budget statement and economic policies of government for 2020 to this Honorable House. I also submit before this August House the 2019 Annual Report on the Petroleum Funds in accordance with Section 48 of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act 2011, Act 815, as amended, and a report on the African Union 0.2% import levy. Mr. Speaker, this statement is an abridged version of the budget statement and economic policy of the government of Ghana for the 2020 financial year. I would like to request the Hansa Department to capture the entire budget statement and economic policy. Mr. Speaker, in substance, 2019 has been a very good year for Ghana. This is the year that one can confidently say this is the year that one can confidently say that God's blessings of the hard work is beginning to manifest, putting us on a positive trajectory for sustained lift. I say so, Mr. Speaker, because we have won some painful but necessary battles for God and country. We have quietly but incontestably achieved significant structural changes for the economy. We have stabilized greatly the macroeconomic turbulence that was all too regular a feature in the management of the national economy. We have delivered, Mr. Speaker, on our flagship programs. Mr. Speaker, the gains made so far are significant, and it is indeed to the glory of God. It is proper to put this budget, Mr. Speaker, into perspective to understand how far he has indeed brought us and we have come. On Thursday, 2nd March 2017, I had the honor and privilege to present the first budget of President Akufuado to this House. At that time, as you may recall, the economy was in very bad shape. <laughs> Suffocating under a mixed weight of debts, arrears, very high cost of living, high youth unemployment, and the worst growth rate since 1994. Moreover, growth in agriculture was declining, industry growth was in the negative, interest rates were high, the banking system was comatose, unemployment was rising, and businesses and households were working mainly to pay off their utility bills. Mr. Speaker, the poor state of public finances, weak policy implementation and lack of policy credibility, clarity, and consistency resulted in Ghana requesting an IMF bailout in August 2014. The economic model being practiced at the time was a simple, unexamined formula of tax, borrow, and spend without a focus on production. The previous government resorted to some draconian fiscal measures, notably the increase in the tax burden on many items and activities, including even condoms, cutlasses, as well as kayai. Mr. Speaker, a freeze was imposed on the public sector from employing people. There were cuts to a number of areas of spending. Most notably were cuts to research advances for lecturers, nursing training, and teacher training allowances. Yet the government then was awarding billions of CDs worth of contracts without knowing about how to pay for them. It was a case of living for today 
and leave in tomorrow to take care of itself. President Akufuado's maiden State of the Nation address captured the situation and his government's attitude towards it succinctly. I quote, too much time, energy, and resources were spent in the past. In my view, without a deliberate conscious assessment of their impact on jobs and whether or not we were spending wisely to improve the lives of the people, communities, and businesses. But I was not elected by the overwhelming majority of the Ghanaian people to complain. I was elected, I was elected to get things done. I was elected to get things done. I was elected to get things done. I was elected to fix what is broken and my government and I are determined to do just that. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what we have done within the last three years. The President has set out his vision and program in clear language in his maiden address. He said this within the context of an economy that was seriously challenged, the full extent of which we were yet to discover. And yet, by January 2017, the nation was hopeful because change had come. In the 2017 budget, we illustrated the MPP government's expectations, aspirations, and hope for Ghana's future. Using the miracle of Jesus when he fed 5,000 people, five loaves of bread, and two fish. Mr. Speaker, we also declared that the budget was going to sow the seeds for growth and jobs, an ASEMPA budget. It was here, Mr. Speaker, that my honorable colleagues across the aisle unwittingly prophesied with their 419 placards in support of our program that my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches in glory to Jesus Christ. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we thank God for their prophecy, for the fulfillment as we see the 12 extra baskets from the two fish and five loaves are here with us. Quite apart from the fragile structure policy and worsening macro fiscal situation passed on to us, this government had to also address serious contractual commitments. The exorbitant energy bill from expensive, difficult to explain, Mr. Speaker, take or pay power purchase agreements. A pileup of unpaid arrears and outstanding commitments mostly accrued from contracts awarded without the slightest care for the public purse. Mr. Speaker, if you add the cost of cleaning the financial sector challenges to the long list of legacy bills that the Akufuado had to settle, the cost of the Ghanaian taxpayer it's around 30 billion Ghana cities, 33 billion Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, exactly two years, eight months, and 14 days later, I stand before you to declare that indeed God has been gracious to us. His favor has shown on our nation, and it is because, in my humble view, we, their new leaders, choose to serve his people rightly and sincerely, and may I add, competently. Mr. Speaker, thankfully, we came in with a plan, and with a, we came in with the plan, and with the help of our gallant men and women of the civil service that we work with, we stayed focused, we kept our discipline, we kept our promises, and managed to strike a balance between maintaining fiscal discipline and supporting businesses and households with tax reliefs. Yes. Mr. Speaker, we dare to abolish all manner of nuisance taxes. Despite the limited resources at our disposal, Mr. Speaker, we implemented our plan, which included the introduction of stimulus packages for some viable but struggling businesses, increasing spending significantly on social services, and implemented our flagship programs. Mr. Speaker, we moved from taxation to production. Mr. Speaker, we found also. Mr. Speaker, we also.
We also focus on a policy of preferential option for the poor to ensure inclusiveness and social justice. Mr. Speaker, as a center-right party, we also were interested in creating wealth for our business people. Mr. Speaker, Professor K. Buzia said, the concept of poverty should be seen not only in terms of cash or the scarcity or underdevelopment of material resources, but also in human conditions, in disease, ignorance, lack of training and education. The first essential requirement for progress is the development of the human being. That is why, Mr. Speaker, President Akufuado would never shy from the, away from the responsibility of investing to prepare our children for their own future. As a result of us introducing the necessary combination of focus, discipline, integrity, creativity, compassion, and competence, in just 32 months in office, Mr. Speaker, the Lord has indeed blessed our efforts. The economy has seen a miraculous turnaround moving now in the right direction. I speak to the data, Mr. Speaker. Economic growth has doubled under President Akufuado, rebounding strongly from 3.4% in 2016, the lowest GDP rate since 1994, averaging 7%. Inflation rate has fallen from 15.4% in December 2016 to 7.6% new series in September 2019, registering the lowest rate in 27 years, Mr. Speaker, which makes 2019 the year of the slowest ever rise in the prices of goods and services in Ghana in the entire history of the Fourth Republic. Yes, Mr. Speaker, 2019 has been good for Ghana because when inflation slows down, everybody benefits. It is on the rise again, recording, recording by mid-year, a year on year after tax credit profit of 1.67 billion, or 37% in 2019. This is good for Ghana because when the banks are strong, the economy is strong. The 91-day Treasury bill fell steadily from nearly 17% in December 2016, and now stands at 14.7%. This is good for Ghana, because when the cost of borrowing is low, businesses expand, jobs are created, and spending rises. We have reduced the fiscal deficit, which on cash and commitment basis was below 5% this year, at 4.5% at the end of the third quarter, of 2019. On the external front, the trade deficit has improved from 1.8 billion in 2016 in deficit to a surplus, Mr. Speaker, of 2.6 billion in August 2019. This is good for Ghana as it helps to keep our currency stable and our economy strong. Today, Mr. Speaker, we can be proud of ourselves for the progress we have made together as Ghanaians. The competent government came into office of a plan and we are delivering according to plan. In the president, the people of Ghana are clear on what they voted for. Leadership, Mr. Speaker, strong, assured, decisive, intelligent, focused, and compassionate leadership. Mr. Speaker, election after election, he has been consistent with his vision, focused on his priorities, and unwavering on the path to getting all of us there. Not even two defeats could shake him away from his convictions. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand here and declare that the President has redeemed virtually all the pledges he made to the people of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, the numbers indeed don't lie, and I have some numbers that make interesting reading. 1.2 million Ghanaian students would have had access to secondary education by 2020, justifying the spending of 2.2 billion Ghana cities. It is gratifying to note that the first cohort of students under the program, numbering about 362,000, are due to graduate in 2020. Mr. Speaker, 1.9 million people have directly benefited from the Planting for Food and Jobs program. 97,373 graduates have been given an opportunity under NAPCO to better position them for future jobs. 83,000 Ghanaians have been recruited under the Forest Plantation Program to help restore our environment. 
a further 138,026 Ghanaians have been employed under various programs to support public sector delivery. 55,000 nurses have been recruited to enhance healthcare delivery. 3.6 million Ghanaians have been registered under the National ID program. 1,000 sanitary facilities are under construction to address identification. 49,000 trainee nurses have been paid 468 million CDs in allowances. 48,000 teacher training have also been paid 532 million CDs in allowances. Mr. Speaker, to support industry and entrepreneurship, 181 companies have benefited from support under the 1DYF program. 12,000 startup businesses have received training support under the government entrepreneurship program. 80 business incubation hubs have been set up across the country to build the capacity of entrepreneurs. 20,000 students have been trained under the Student Entrepreneurship Initiative. 100 disabled women have been empowered to start businesses. That one, Mr. Speaker, is finally at peace. Mr. Speaker, in fulfillment of our promise, IPEF has developed, developed, delivered the following. 307 ambulances have been procured for distributing to each constituency and all regional and teaching hospitals to enhance health care. 200 dams have been completed and additional 360 uh, dams are under construction. 50 prefabricated grain warehouses have been constructed to reduce post-harvest losses and 50 rural markets are under construction to enhance trade within our local assemblies. Mr. Speaker, I wish to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to you and honorable members for the wise counsel, support, activism, opposition, and cooperation that you have given to the executive since 2017. There I say our friends on the other side of this house have proven to be very vocal opposition. Mr. Speaker, our macroeconomic achievements have not gone unnoticed. Our discipline and determination have been recognized by our global partners, namely the AU, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, to mention a few. Mr. Speaker, this is manifested by the president selected as a co-chair of the SDG Advocates and Advocate for Gender for the AU, Ghana represented by the Minister of Finance as the chairperson of the Development Committee of the World Bank, and Ghana represented by the Governor of the Bank of Ghana, appointed as the incoming chair of the Board of Governors of the Bretton Wood Institutions. Mr. Speaker, the budget I'll be presenting today is critical in various aspects. First, it is an election year budget, and we know the history of such budgets. Second, it is the first since 2015 to be done without the IMF program because of our successful completion of the derailed IMF program last April. And third, it is the first election year budget to be prepared under Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, which places a 5% cap on fiscal deficit in any given year. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, government will make a strong push on the underlisted priorities in order to consolidate the gains achieved within the last three years and to drive our economic transformation forward in line with the President Consolidated Program and the Ghana Beyond Aid vision. Domestic revenue mobilization. We will take radical policy and institutional reforms towards raising our tax to GDP ratio over the medium term from under 13% currently to over 20%. The focus will be on efficiency and base broadening rather than imposing new taxes on our people and businesses. This way, we can raise our domestic contribution to our ambitious transformation agenda in line with the Ghana Beyond Aid vision. Business regulatory reforms. A three-year reform initiative coordinated by the Minister of Trade and Industry and GIPC will be implemented to make Ghana one of the most transparently and efficiently regulated business environments in Africa. This will empower our local businesses and also help us realize the ambition of making Ghana the gateway to business in Africa. Intensified drive for FDI. We need higher amounts of external private capital to complement government resources in driving our transformation. So we will aggressively go after foreign direct investment. To this end, GIPC will be better resource of human and financial capital. In addition, government has established an interministerial committee to provide coordinated policy guidance and support to the FDI drive. Enhance financial support to local enterprises. 
government will deploy early in 2020 a number of initiatives to enhance the access of our businesses to finance, including medium and long-term capital. These include the new National Development Bank, the Ghana Incentives-Based Risk Sharing System for Agriculture Learning Gersel, and a new Enterprise Credit Scheme, the Ghana Commodity Exchange and a Strengthened Venture Capital Trust Fund, International Financial Services Center. Work is progressing steadily on preparation to realize government vision of establishing Ghana as a regional financial services center in West Africa. The concept now has been approved by government and work is going ongoing to draft an international financial services bill for broader stakeholder consultation. Digitization. We aim to use digitization to transform a development path in line with global realities of the fourth industrial revolution. We will continue the impressive achievements made over the last three years in using digitization to improve government services and make it more accessible to Ghanaians. We will also intensify efforts to support the development of fintech and the knowledge economy in Ghana. Accelerated infrastructure development. We will accelerate financing for infrastructure by actively leveraging innovative sources of finance. To this end, we are strengthening the capacity of the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund to tap into global financial markets, including branded finance and sovereign wealth funds supporting private sector development. Science and technology. The foundation for industrialization is science and technology. Government has therefore resolved to complement our advances in human capital in the education sector with a focused push to develop our national technological capability. To this end, Government, through the Ministry of Science, Environment, Technology and Innovation, MESTI, will establish the Ghana Design and Manufacturing Center, GDMC, a center of excellence in design, manufacturing, and technology commercialization. GDMC will facilitate the incubation of new technological industries and serve as a resource for national resource institutions and private industry. Private sector. Mr. Speaker. Private sector remains the key to jobs and transformation of our economy. We have had meaningful discussions, and the Minister of Trade and Industry has established the public-private dialogue series to ensure a coordinated strategy for transformation. Mr. Speaker, 2020 is an election year. I would like to take this opportunity to inform this August House, on behalf of the President, that all the needed resources required shall be marshaled for the Electoral Commission to ensure that we have credible, free, and fair elections. Ghana remains one of the most stable and peaceful countries in the world, and we intend to maintain it. In spite of the year being an election year, Mr. Speaker, let me repeat that President Akufuado and his government would ensure that the perennial excessive spending during such periods will not happen in 2020. We shall work within the 2020 appropriated resource envelope and adhere to the Fiscal Responsibility Act to maintain fiscal discipline. We will do so not because we are complacent of our chances, no, we will do so because the nation needs it and we are not prepared to throw away all the sacrifices and gains the people and their government have made in the last three years. We shall consolidate our macroeconomic gains and offer businesses and households the predictability and stability that they need to manage their lives. Mr. Speaker, Ghana has developed an integrated institutional framework for the implementation of SDGs from the national to the sub-national levels. The SDGs have been embedded in the President's coordinated program for economic and social development, policies, national policies, and objectives of the government's flagship program. Mr. Speaker, this systematic approach has made it possible for Ghana to be the first country in the world to incorporate the SDGs into our national charter. For the last two years, 2018 and 2019, Ghana has been among the fastest growing economies in the world. Ghana's recent growth has not been primarily driven by oil. It has been more broad-based. In fact, non-oil GDP has increased from 4.6% in 2016 to 6.5% in 2018, and it's projected, and it's projected to reach 6% in 2019, and 6.7% in 2020, respectively. Reflecting, Mr. Speaker, 
the impact of our flagship programs. Mr. Speaker, the increased economic growth has been the result of increased agricultural industrial output. As a result of the successful planting for food and jobs program, agricultural GDP growth has increased from 2.9% in 2016 to 4.8% in 2018 and projected to reach 6.4% in 2019. It is heartening to note that unlike in the past, Ghana has not had to import maize for food consumption in the last two years. Industry has also seen a recovery of industry growth increasing from 4.3% in 2016 to 10.6% in 2018 and projected to grow to 8.8% in 2019. This, Mr. Speaker, is real change. Mr. Speaker, the restoration and sustainability of macro stability has been a cornerstone of the economic policy of President Akufuado's government. Without macroeconomic stability, all the goals that we have set for ourselves as a country will not be achieved. As a demonstration of our commitment to macroeconomic stability, we have pursued a policy of fiscal discipline which we have supported with the passage of the Fiscal Responsibility Act that limits the fiscal deficit in any year to 5% of GDP and also the establishment of a fiscal council. Mr. Speaker, the fiscal deficits on cash basis are significantly falling from 6.5% of GDP in 2016 to 4.5% of GDP in 2019, in September 2019. For the first time in a decade, Ghana recorded primary surpluses, that is our tax revenues exceeded all government spending, excluding debt service payments, for two years in a row. That, Mr. Speaker, is real change. Economic management under the Fourth Republic, with a session of 2004, has tended to follow a pattern of political business cycle where election years have been characterized by fiscal indiscipline. We have witnessed various governments spending excessively to finance off-budget expenditures that led to major fiscal slippages, as in the case of 2016, when the then government recorded a fiscal deficit of 6.5% against its own target of 3.9%. Therefore, the decision of the president to impose on himself a binding legislative constraint of accompanying sanctions for me as a finance minister, I believe this is a clear manifestation of our commitment to fiscal discipline. We pledge the Ghanaians that we will not derail this economy that we have worked so hard to fix. This, Mr. Speaker, is real change. Fiscal performance for 2019. Mr. Speaker, government remains committed to safeguarding the macro fiscal gains that we have achieved over the last three years in the management of the nation's public finances. The implementation of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, establishment and operationalization of the Fiscal Responsibility Advisory and Financial Stability Councils have complemented several other institutional and structural reforms to strengthen fiscal discipline and ensure irreversibility of policies. Mr. Speaker, over the first nine months of 2019 fiscal year, provisional fiscal data indicates that the fiscal deficit arising from government's fiscal operation was 4.5% of GDP on a cash basis. This compares to a deficit target of 4.1% of GDP for the period. The higher than program fiscal deficit resulted mainly from revenue underperformance. Although expenditures were also below target, the expenditure execution rate was higher than revenue execution rate. Mr. Speaker, total revenue and grants for the period amounted to 36.3 billion Ghana CDs, 10.5% of GDP. The outturn represented a per annum growth of 9.2%, despite a 13.6% shortfall relative to the target of 42 billion, 12.1% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, the general underperformance of tax revenue mainly stems from shortfalls in international trade taxes on, and on income and property taxes. This shortfall in international trade taxes which consists on import duty and levies, external VAT, customs, national health and get fund levies resulted from lower import volumes, higher admittance of imported goods into a zero rated and our tax exempt import brackets and the lower tariff bonds up to the 10% tariff levels. Total expenditures, 
including areas currents amounted to Ghana CDs 51.9 billion, 15.1% of GDP, compared to the target of 56.1 billion, 16.2% of GDP. Except for interest payment, all expenditures line items were contained within their respective targets. Mr. Speaker, following government's fiscal operations, the overall fiscal balance on cash basis resulted in a deficit of Ghana cities 15.7 billion, equivalent to the 4.5% of GDP, against a target of 14.2 billion, or 4.1% of GDP. The higher than program financing, especially from domestic resources, stems mainly from the front loading of financing requirements to meet government expenditures and our debt service obligations, including for the settlement of uncovered government auctions for lending substantial revenue shortfalls. Mr. Speaker, the primary balance for the period was a deficit of 916 million Ghana cities, 0.3% of GDP, against a targeted primary surplus of 201.7 million Ghana cities, 0.1% of GDP. Outlook for end year 2019. Mr. Speaker, based on the provisional fiscal outturn for the first nine months of the year, revised projections for the year resulted in total revenue and grants of 54.6 billion, 15.8% of GDP. This projection represents a 7.4% shortfall relative to the 2019 revised annual budget target of 58.9 billion, 17.0% of GDP. Although available data supports the fact that revenue mobilization is most robust in the last quarter of every year, it is prudent to remain conservative with the revenue projections in order to avoid excess spending in the last quarter. Mr. Speaker, consequently, discretionary expenditure will be adjusted accordingly to ensure the fiscal deficit target is not compromised and remains within the fiscal responsibility rule target of not more than 5% of GDP. Specifically, the fiscal deficit is projected to reach about 4.7% of GDP with a primary surplus of about 0.9% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, total public debt has increased from 122.3 billion in 2016 to 208.6 billion, including the cost of the banking sector cleanup at the end of September 2019. However, the strong fiscal adjustment and better debt management has meant that the rate of debt accumulation, excluding the banking sector cleanup, of 14.3% is the second lowest in the decade. The debt to GDP ratio increased from 56.9% in 2016 to 57.5% at the end of September 2019, excluding the financial sector bill. Including financial sector bailout and energy payments, the debt to GDP ratio was 60.55 as at the end of September 2019. Mr. Speaker, we promise to move the economic policy away from one focus on taxation to one focus on production, and we have done just that over the last three years. I would like to note that import duties were reduced by 50% from April 2019. The 1% special import levy was abolished, Excise duty on petroleum was abolished. 17.5% of VAT on financial services was abolished. 17.5% VAT on selected important medicines was abolished. 17.5% VAT on real estate sales was abolished. 17.5% VAT on domestic airline tickets was abolished. Abolished import duty on importation of spare parts. Abolished taxation of gains from the realization of security lists on the Ghana Stock Exchange and publicly held securities approved by the SEC, abolished levies on KIA, and reduced electricity tariffs. Notwithstanding the fact that the communication service tax was recently increased from 6 to 9 percent, the overall direction regarding the burden of taxation on Ghanaians has been overwhelmingly downward in the last three years. Mr. Speaker, inflation has declined from 15.4 percent in 2016 to 7.6 percent new series as of 2019. Indeed, inflation has been in single digits since April 2018, i.e. for the last 18 months, and is at its lowest rate in 27 years. That is real change. Mr. Speaker, in line with the decline in inflation, 
Interest rates have also been on a downward trend, with average bank lending rates falling significantly from 31.7% in 2016 to 24% by 2019, but we have more to do. Mr. Speaker, lending rates are still high. Improvements in macroeconomic environments alone will not bring interest rates down. There are many other structural fractures, fractures in our financial system that are causing high interest rates. In addition to sustaining macro stability, government is actively working to remove these structural bottlenecks to support lower interest rates. Mr. Speaker, it was clear after taking office that we had inherited a financial system tottering on the edge of collapse, which was known to the previous government, but was negligently left unaddressed. The new leadership of the Bank of Ghana therefore moved decisively to restore soundness and stability to the financial system. For banks, savings and loans, and microfinance companies, 4.6 million depositors, Mr. Speaker, were at risk of losing their entire savings. The Bank of Ghana undertook a number of reforms, including increases in minimum capital requirement, revocation of the licenses of insolvent banks, resulting in the consolidation of banks from 34 to 23 by the end of December 2018. Consequently, we now, Mr. Speaker, have a banking sector that is well capitalized, liquid, and well positioned to improve the flow of funds in the economy and to drive private sector-led growth and development. The, this unexpected fiscal cost of the cleanup has thus far caused the taxpayer over 13 billion Ghana cities in order to see show that the annual depreciation of the city to the U.S. dollar between 2017 and 2019 has been the slowest since 2012. Before we assumed office, the city depreciated by 14.5% in 2013, 31.2% in 2014, 15.7% in 2015, and 9.7% in 2016. An annual average, Mr. Speaker, of 17.7%. Since 2017, however, the CD has appreciated by an average of 7.8%. This is real change. Mr. Speaker, we shall recall that the weak fundamentals of the economy meant that the NDC government had to end up seeking a bailout from the IMF in 2015. The difference today is stark and glaring. Under our competent economic management, the fundamentals have strengthened, and Ghana successfully exited the IMF program. This is real change. Mr. Speaker, indeed, the strength of Ghana's fundamentals was confirmed on March 16, 2019, by Standard & Poor's Global, which affirmed Ghana's sovereign rating at B with a stable outlook after upgrading Ghana's sovereign credit rating from B- to B with a stable outlook last year. This was the first upgrade by SNP for Ghana in 10 years. This is real change. Mr. Speaker, with stronger finances, government also transferred some 3.1 billion Ghana CDs of tier two pension funds into the custodial accounts of the pension schemes of the labor unions, funds that have been outstanding since 2013. That is real change. Mr. Speaker, we have also established a national entrepreneurship and innovation program under which 3,000 startups and small businesses have benefited from a special government business support program with beneficiary receiving between 10,000 CDs and 100,000 CDs each at a special interest rate of 10%. That is real change. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the medium-term macroeconomic targets. Following our significant progress in restoring macroeconomic stability over the past 32 months, we will continue to implement policies and programs to ensure the fulfillment of our promises to our people. The following macroeconomic targets are set for the medium term. Overall real GDP growth to average 5.7% for the period, non-oil GDP to grow at an average of 5.9% for the period, inflation to be within the target band of 8 plus or minus 2%, Overall, fiscal deficit to remain within the Fiscal Responsibility Act threshold of not more than 5% of GDP, the primary balance to be in a surplus, and gross international reserves to cover 
at least 3.5 months of imports of goods and services. Mr. Speaker, based on the overall macroeconomic objective of consolidating the gains for growth, jobs, and prosperity for all, the following specific macroeconomic targets have been set for the 2020 fiscal year. Overall real GDP growth of 6.8%, non-oil real GDP growth of 6.7%, end period inflation of 8%, fiscal deficit of 4.7% of GDP, primary surplus of 0.8% of GDP, and gross international reserve to cover not less than 3.5 months of imports of goods and services. Mr. Speaker, to further strengthen our commitment to maintaining fiscal discipline, the focus of fiscal policy in 2020 is to ensure that the fiscal deficit, which remains the principal fiscal anchor, is reduced to low and sustainable levels, enough to reduce overall public debt burden and create the need of fiscal space over the medium term. Mr. Speaker, total revenue and grants for 2020 is projected at 67.1 billion, 16.9% of GDP, up from a projected outcome for 2019 of 54.6 billion, 15.8% of GDP. Domestic revenue is estimated at 65.8 billion, representing an annual growth of 22.5% over the projected outcome for 2019. Grants disbursements from development partners is estimated at 1.2 billion, 0.3% of GDP, and a nominal growth of 48.8% over the projected outturn of 833.2 million in 2019. Mr. Speaker, total expenditures, including clearance of areas, is projected at 85.9 billion, 21.6% of GDP in 2020. The expenditure estimate for 2020 represents a growth of 21.2% above the projected outturn for 2019. Mr. Speaker, wages and salaries are projected at 22.9 billion and constitute 26.7% of the total expenditure, including areas clearance. Use of goods and services is also projected at 8.3 billion, 2.1% of GDP, and 9.7% of the total expenditure, including areas clearance. Interest payments on public debt is projected at 21.7 billion, 5.4% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, government will continue with the implementation of the EMR Funds Capital and Realignment Act to reduce budget rigidities and create the needed fiscal space to fund growth enhancing expenditures. Consequently, transfers to treasury funds as well as all other EMR funds are estimated at 15.6 billion, 3.9% of GDP in 2020, representing 19.6% growth over the projected outturn for 2019. Mr. Speaker, capital expenditure is projected at 9.3 billion, 2.3% of GDP, representing 53.5% increase over the 2019 projected outturn. Of this amount, domestic finance capital expenditure is estimated at 3.8 billion, 0.9% of GDP, while foreign finance capital expenditure is estimated at 5.5 billion, 1.4% of GDP, to be funded by a combination of project grants and loans. Budget balances and finance operations for 2020. Mr. Speaker, based on the estimates for total revenue and grants and total expenditure, the 2020 fiscal operations will result in a cash deficit of 18.9 billion, equivalent to 4.7% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, financing of the fiscal deficit from domestic sources will amount to 8.3 billion, 2.0% of GDP, while foreign financing of the deficit will amount to 10.6 billion, 2.7% of GDP, and will include a planned international capital market program to raise up to 3 billion US dollars, of which $2 billion will support the implementation of the 2020 budget, as well as for domestic liability management. Mr. Speaker, primary surplus equivalent to 0.7% of GDP, 3 billion Ghana cities, is estimated for 2020. Mr. Speaker, 
the total petroleum revenue for 2020 is projected at US 1.150 million in line with the PRMA, we would like to propose the allocation of the petroleum revenue as follows. Allocate 332.16 million to GMPC for its equity financing costs and share of the net carried and participating interest. Allocate 70% of the benchmark revenue of 818.68 million US dollars to APFA. Allocate 30% of the benchmark revenue 245.6 million US dollars to the Ghana Petroleum Funds and allocate 171.92 million US dollars of the Ghana Petroleum Funds amount to the Ghana Stabilization Fund and 73.68 million US dollars to the Ghana Heritage Fund. Mr. Speaker, the government will maintain the cap on the Ghana Stabilization Fund at 300 million Ghana US dollars in line of Section 23 of the PRMA. Revenue measures. Mr. Speaker, government shall continue to provide the necessary support to the Ghana Revenue Authority in their ongoing reforms for 2020 and the medium term to optimize revenue collection. The full year yield from the 2019 media revenue measures are expected to be robust in 2020 to complement tax and compliance efforts. Government will pursue the following revenue measures, among others, to boost domestic revenue. Government shall renew and extend the national fiscal stabilization levy and special import levies for five years to support the budget. In line, in line of government policy, the personal income tax ban will be adjusted and the necessary parliamentary approval sought to ensure that a 12% minimum wage increase for 2020 is tax exempt. Personal reliefs such as marriage relief, child education relief, and old age relief, which were last adjusted in 2015, will also be reviewed upwards to ensure the relief consistent with government's commitment to support families. So this will be enhanced relief for families, children, and old age. Mr. Speaker, as you can see, we have not imposed any new taxes. To, to address the challenges of revenue mobilization, government will restructure the tax system and develop a comprehensive revenue policy and strategy. The Ghana Revenue Authority occupies a critical position in the economy and is responsible for approximately 70% of domestic revenues. After 10 years of integration, government is ready to carry out the next generation of reforms in revenue administration. A transformation program centered around the three main themes of people, technology, and service will be structured with the new leadership of GRA to create a new GRA that will reflect the very best of efficiency, professionalism, and productivity compliance measures for the petroleum downstream sector. Mr. Speaker, over the years, we have experienced under-reporting, a diversion and dilution of fuel products and general non-compliance in the petroleum downstream sector. This causes government to lose considerable revenue. In, in the year ahead, the spotlight will be turned on the sector to address these irregularities and indiscipline that have become characteristics of this industry. The ambitious actions include providing additional powers to the relevant institutions and enhancing punitive sanctions to change the licenses of recalcitrant players in the industry and prosecuting directors and key personnel of such entities. Automating all processes in the sector to reduce human interventions and provide transparency and instituting stricter monitoring controls. Energy sector. Update on excess capacity challenges in the energy sector. Mr. Speaker, as part of the media fiscal policy review, government announced its intention to rationalize commercial agreements in Ghana's energy sector, including reassessing all take or pay contracts and imposing a moratorium on the signing of new agreements in the energy sector, with a view to establishing a managed transition 
to overcome the unsustainable excess supply situation that continues to pose grave risks to the country's economic progress. Consequently, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Energy on 26 August 2019 hosted Ghana's independent power producers and gas suppliers at a stakeholder forum during which government reiterated the urgent need for these energy sector interventions and outlined government's intended approach to implementing them. As well, government invited our IPPs and gas suppliers to partner and collaborate with government in this crucial exercise. Our government seeks a thoughtful and managed transition from the onerous take or pay paradigm towards a balanced contractual relationship capable of delivering fair, enduring energy solutions that reflect reality and offer long-term sustainability for power purchase agreements and gas supply agreements in Ghana. Subsequently, on October 28, 2019, government inaugurated a steering committee under the Energy Sector Recovery Tax Force, whose purpose it is to take responsibility for the collaborative bilateral consultation process between government and each independent power producer and gas supplier designed to help government and its energy sector partners achieve a money transition towards more balanced, long-term relationship and sustainable energy partnership. Mr. Speaker, this collaborative bilateral consultation process, which has so far been welcomed by the investor community, will provide a forum for stakeholders to contribute to Ghana's energy strategy, which is fundamental to the country's industrialization and sustainable growth. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform this August House that government negotiating teams have been constituted and are now close to completing the first round of bilateral consultation meetings with several IPPs as well as project sponsors. Significantly, government views these collaborative bilateral consultations as an essential exercise which not only limits downside risk to investors over the medium to long term, but also demonstrate government's full commitment to progressively restoring confidence in the energy sector, as well as across other key sectors in our rapidly growing economy. Mr. Speaker, it is also worth highlighting that in line with these energy sector interventions and to ensure the success of the bilateral consultation process, government in line with the decision taken in July mid-year as formally instructed sector ministry department and agencies as follows to suspend all ongoing negotiations on PPAs and GSAs, energy gas and purchase agreements, or any other long-term take or pay contracts for power or gas until further notice. The government has placed a complete moratorium on the signing of new PPAs, GSAs and put call option agreements, and hereby instructs ECG, GMPC, GNGC and VRA to abstain from entering into any new PPAs GSAs, LNG SPAs, long-term take or pay contracts, and POSA until discussions with Ministry of Energy and Ministry of Finance. That all future PPAs and GSAs, LNG SPAs, and long-term take or pay contracts shall be subject to competitive and transparent procurement procedures, and government will henceforth not entertain or accept any unsolicited proposal. Government intends to enforce these interventions and expect strict compliance by all affected MDAs and potential investors. In this regard, government will notify MDAs on a case-by-case -case basis of any applicable exceptions with regard to the objectives of the Energy Sector Recovery Program, a roadmap jointly developed by the Government of Ghana and the World Bank, which delineates immediate, near-term, and medium-term actions needed to achieve government aim of bringing the sector into balance in the medium term. Mr. Speaker, we expect this to be a gradual but challenging process with many potential complexities. However, government remains undeterred and will spare no effort to ensure that it is fully prepared financially, organizationally, and with the requisite technical wherewithal to confront these challenges head on. Additionally, as part of the rationalization process, the car power ship has been relocated to the western region and retrofitted to use gas instead of HFO. Car power ship will thus become the key uptaker for the take or pay 
tank of our gas. This will generate substantial savings for government. Indeed, unlike the past, this government recognizes that a focused, disciplined, and coordinated approach is required to resolve the substantial challenges in the energy sector. In this regard, government aims through this consultation process to, among others, create a standardized, sustainable framework for future PPA and GCA contracting, which all new IPPs and gas suppliers who wish to participate in Ghana's energy sector will be required to adopt in the future. Truly, Mr. Speaker, the staggering cost and negative macrofiscal impact of Ghana's excess power and gas supply problem necessitates the full force and uninterrupted focus of government in the execution of this all-important exercise. And Mr. Speaker, this is precisely what we intend to do. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, on July 30th, 2019, government suspended the Power Distribution Service, PDS concession, following government's detection of fundamental and material breaches of PDS's obligation in the provision of payment securities for the transaction and related matters. After further investigation and extensive consultation with relevant stakeholders, government on October 19, 2019, announced its intention, decision to terminate the PDS concession. Regardless, Ghana is fully committed to private sector participation in ECG and is focused on moving forward with urgency to find a suitable replacement for the PDS arrangements. Moreover, we are prepared to review the transaction structure and indeed recognize the need to improve significantly the management of ECG by bringing in world-class private sector expertise and attracting adequate private capital. Mr. Speaker, considering ECG's current distribution system losses of 24%, comprising 13% commercial and 11% technical losses, government is truly motivated by the urgent need to reduce these losses and improve service quality through the effective deployment of modern technology and world-class technical expertise with a view to creating a financially viable power distribution sector that is sufficiently equipped to meet the current and future needs of Ghanaian households and businesses. Mr. Speaker, as we crystallize plans for the future of ECG, government is also enthused by the critical need to ensure the transfer of skills with a view to building local capacity as well as introducing international best practices to enhance the operational, technical, commercial, and financial wherewithal of our national electricity distribution utility. Against this backdrop, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that government intends to initiate an accelerated tender process to select a new private partner for ECG in the coming months. It is indeed government's intention to make relevant adjustments to enhance the existing bid documents and tailor the process to optimize the selection from companies having a track record of managing and operating a comparable utility so as to achieve fair, transparent, and expeditious disclosure of the transaction. Mr. Speaker, we cannot overstate the importance of learning from past mistakes if we are to make sound decisions going forward. However, we have no doubt that a well-executed partnership between ECG and the right technical and financial partners will certainly improve our distribution capabilities and enhance end-user experiences. In this regard, heightened scrutiny will be brought to bear in the design and implementation of the financial and technical evaluation criteria to ensure that interested bidders know they have credibility and extensive experience in operating and managing a comparable electricity utility, but also possess the financial wherewithal to make the requisite investment in ECG to achieve significant reductions in technical and commercial losses, as well as drive operational efficiency to deliver sustained service reliability for the benefit of all Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, whilst restoring private sector participation in the management operations and financing of the required investment in ECG distribution assets, government will make every effort to avoid the pitfalls that the PDS concession encountered 
and institute broad Ghanaian institutional participation, as well as demonstrate local equity participation with an eventual listing on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear that the decisions we take in respect of this transaction will continue to affirm our time-honored reputation as a business-friendly nation that respects the rule of law and expects to remain an attractive destination for foreign direct investment. Mr. Speaker, while on the subject, Ghana remains committed to its relationship with the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Indeed, government fully respects and is committed to the essential principles underlying the relationship between the MCC and the government of Ghana, as well as the overall bilateral relationship between Ghana and the United States. Moreover, government committed, is, remains committed to the energy sector reforms as envisioned and above the MCC Compact and the Energy Sector Recovery Program developed with the support of the World Bank. Financial Services. Mr. Speaker, following the successful completion of reforms in the banking sector, which began in August 2017, the resilient banking sector has emerged with improved financial soundness indicators in line with expectations. Even with fewer banks, asset growth within the banking sector in 2019 continues to be robust, underpinned by sustained growth in deposits and higher capital levels, while credit has continued to recover compared to the same period last year. Mr. Speaker, at the start of the reform in August 2017, total assets were 81.1 million for a sector that had 36 banks, and two years after the reform process started. Total assets have increased to 115.2 billion at the end of August 2019, with only 23 banks. In the same direction, total deposits have improved from 55.7 billion to 76 billion over the same comparative period, reflecting a stronger deposit base owing to more trust and confidence in the banking sector with fewer but stronger banks. Banks' profitability has also been greatly enhanced with a significant pickup in profits after tax in 2019 compared to the previous year. The sector solvency remains strong with the capital adequacy ratio even under the more stringent capital requirements directive under the Basel two and three framework well above the new regulatory minimum of 13%. Mr. Speaker, similar to the banking sector and prior to the reforms, the specialized deposit institutions was plagued with acute liquidity and insolvency challenges. This continued as this imposed severe risk to the stability of the financial system and to depositors. As a result, in two separate cleanup exercises, the licenses of these insolvent institutions were revoked in order to curtail a spillover of these weaknesses to other sectors of the financial industry. Mr. Speaker, insolvent specialized deposit institutions comprising 23 savings and loans and finance houses companies and 347 microfinance companies and non-bank financial institutions comprising 39 microcredit companies, one dormant leasing company and one dormant remittance company were also resolved in May and August 2019 respectively to safeguard the financial system against potential contagion and weaknesses in the SDI sector, which threatened three road against made in the banking sector. It is important to note, Mr. Speaker, that although the cleanup exercises were completed quite recently, there are already indicators of improved performance within the SDI sector, evidenced by improved capital positions, profitability, management efficiency, and liquidity within the sector. The completion of reforms within the banks and SDI industry in August 2019 was timely and paved the way for the organization of the Ghana Deposit Prote Protection Scheme in December 2019. The scheme will protect the national budget from costs arising from the banking sector failure, if that were even to happen in the future, and ensure that going forward, all deposited funds are insured against bank and SDI failures. This scheme, supplemented by effective regulation, regulation and supervision by the Bank of Ghana and the work of the Financial Stability Council, will go a long way to make our financial system more resilient and supportive of our efforts to foster inclusive socioeconomic growth. The central bank will continue to pursue policies and strengthen supervision 
to ensure that the banking sector remains well capitalized, solvent, liquid, and profitable, and to also ensure that significant gains recorded in the aftermath of the reforms and recapitalization exercise are locked in. Credit risk management practices and loan recovery efforts will be stepped up to minimize overall risk in the banking sector. Mr. Speaker, over the past two years, the management of the Securities and Exchange Commission has worked on various reforms and appraised the state of operators in the industry. In line with the powers invested in the Commission under Act 929, Sections 3 and 122, the Commission revoked the licenses of 53 fund management companies on Friday, 8 November 2019. Of these firms, 21 has ceased operation with the remaining 32 in various states of distress and all regulatory non-compliance before the revocation. Through this, through this firm and decisive intervention, the Commission will preserve the investment of over 77,000 retail investors and over 4,700 institutional investors. The investment portfolio of the affected firms amounted to 8 billion Ghana CDs, of which 2.4 billion, 30% was invested in treasury bills, banks, and listed equities. Yeah, the actions affected 249 licensed representatives. This exercise seeks to protect investors, restore transparency, and introduce greater accountability whilst instilling higher ethical standards through improvements of the licensing and supervisory framework. Mr. Speaker, the intervention by government to save depositors and in investors whose funds were locked up or failed financial institutions has been very costly. In 2017 and 2018, government spent $11.7 billion to safeguard the deposit held by universal banks that were resolved by Bank of Ghana and to set up the Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited. These amounts were mainly through the issuance of government debt to both GCP Bank and CBG. This year, government had to again intervene to provide relief to depositors when the Bank of Ghana revoked the license of 347 microfinance institutions, 15 savings and loans, and eight finance houses. The total bailout cost estimate for this exercise was 2.4 billion. As a speaker, the Bank of Ghana again provided the cash for this. Mr. Speaker, the Securities and Exchange Commission also revoked the license of 53 asset management companies that were distressed with an estimated fiscal cost to protect investors of 1.5 billion Ghana cities. In addition, government also provided bridge funding of up to 800 million cities for Ghana Amalgamated Trust to enable it to invest in four indigenous banks that were struggling to meet the minimum capital requirement of 400 million Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, these interventions were timely to ensure that we safeguard the financial system, provided relief to many families and businesses, as well as to protect jobs, local interests in the financial system. Mr. Speaker, it is important to state that government has not under any circumstances intentionally collapsed any financial institution. These institutions, Mr. Speaker, were insolvent and all distressed as a result of their own actions and their respective regulators stepped in to intervene and to save over 4 million depositors and investors. Our commitment, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that we provide relief to many of the victims. The total estimated call for our fiscal intervention excluding interest payments from 2017 to 2019, is estimated at 16.4 billion Ghana cities, about 5% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge the pain and distress that has befallen some depositors and investors, including pensioners, market women, churches, hospitals, etc., 
who place their confidence in these financial institutions. The ongoing prosecutions would ensure that all, the, all those culpable, as well as the negligent officials of the regulators, will face justice as soon as possible. With this cleanup, the financial sector is now sanitized and the public should have confidence in the sector. Ghana Amalgamated Trust. Mr. Speaker, the Ghana Amalgamated Trust PLC was set up in December 2018 as an urgent policy response to help support five indigenous banks, Agricultural Development ADB Bank, Omni Basic, Prudential Bank, Universal Bank, Merchant Bank, and National Investment Bank, NIB, as they were unable to raise equity to meet Bank of Ghana's new mandatory minimum capital of 400 million by December 31, 2018. All the insolvent banks whose licenses were revoked by BOG were indigenous banks which had a contagious, contagious effect on the remaining indigenous banks, making it hard for them to raise additional capital. To ensure, Mr. Speaker, that indigenous sponsorship in the banking industry is protected and over 5,400 direct jobs and 12,000 direct jobs are kept, the government set up GATT and announced a major intervention to provide a sovereign guarantee of up to two billion to GATT as a backstop to encourage investors to support our local banks. Government successfully got the approval from parliament to issue a sovereign guarantee for GATT to enable it issue bonds and invest equity in the participating banks. Mr. Speaker, the process was, however, affected by a legal suit challenging the debt instrument to be issued by GATT for equity investment in the participating bank. In response, the legal advisor at Bank of Ghana's Freeze and Exchange Commission and the MPRA advised the following to enable a successful capitalization of the banks nonetheless to meet the social objections, objectives of the government. Replacement of original bond framework for GATT with a preference share framework for investors. Initial bridge capitalization of 800 million by government to enable GATT to invest in the first four banks, ADB, Omnibusic, Prudential, and Universal Merchant Bank, UMB. And a subsequent raising of amount of up to 800 million from investors but by a full call option from government to enable GATT to proceed with the original structure as planned, but via preference shares. Accordingly, Parliament is therefore requested to approve the 800 million initial capitalization of GATT for investment in the four participating bank under the new structure and the PCO. The PCO will replace the sovereign guarantee that was previously approved for the banks. National Investment Bank. Mr. Speaker, government took a decision to deal with NIB separately from the other four participating banks because of a unique challenge and the fact that it was 100% owned by the state. Over the past months, the government has worked to strengthen the management, ensure regulatory compliance, but it challenges government in October 2019, and then to a swap arrangement of NIB with respect to the Nestle shares, giving NIB 500 million Ghana CDs of new liquidity for the Nestle shares. The final assessment of the bank, however, showed a much wider capital shortfall, of 2 billion as at the end of 2018, which it will need to raise to enable it to meet the new Bank of Ghana minimal capital requirement. NIP under the GATT initiative has also developed a new strategy that will transform it into a specialized bank. Going forward, NIP shall focus on promoting industrialization by deploying the right products and services to finance industry across the country and in line with national development priorities. In this regard, Parliament is requested to approve a 2.2 billion put call option from government to GATT to enable it raise the required funding for NIB via preference shares. This will replace the government guarantee to GATT that was previously approved. Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited. Mr. Speaker, Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited, which was formed as a bridge bank to assume that the good assets of the seven defined local banks in August 2018 has made considerable progress in terms of paying depositors whose monies were locked up with these institutions and still maintaining most of them as clients. The progress made by CPG, the jobs retained, as well as the rehiring of some of the staff of the now defunct banks that were out of jobs, attests to the hard work of the Bank of Ghana. 
the receivers and all stakeholders in the banking sector cleanup process to ensure that the resolution of the crisis was as smooth as possible. We are confident that at next month, the financial sector, which is now on a sounder footing, will expand considerably and new jobs will be created. For the progress made by CBG, the bank has requested that the government consider and approve for its articles of incorporation to be amended to convert it into a normal universal bank and not a bridge bank. Government has recognized the need to strengthen CBG and protect the jobs of this bank and has therefore given the go-ahead for, for CBG to undertake the needed regulatory process with the Bank of Ghana for it to be regularized. Changing the environment for private sector credit. Mr. Speaker, government has worked very hard to reverse the deteriorating macroeconomic environment it inherited, reduce inflation and interest rates, stabilize the exchange rate, restore sanity in the financial sector, and undertook large-scale social intervention programs in education, smallholder agriculture initiatives such as planting and rain for food and jobs, among others, which are prerequisites for private sector-led growth and job creation. Mr. Speaker, from 2020, government will begin major interventions to boost private sector credit to support all segments of the business community. In 2019, government engaged many stakeholders with respect to access to credit for the private sector. Experts went across the length and breadth of the country to meet with SMEs and artisans, proprietors and associations to get a better understanding of the challenges they face in assessing credit. While the ministry also engaged the AGR Bankers Association, among others, prior to this year's budget. Through evidence-based research and field engagement of over 40 business associations, credit needs of micro, small, and medium enterprises in the country, government is ready to take advantage of the macro gains and enhance social cohesion through our social intervention initiative to focus on private sector growth, home ownership, and infrastructure development, including toll roads. The key institutions to anchor this shift will be the National Development Bank, the Enterprise Credit Scheme, and the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. In this regard, the following initiative will be undertaken in 2020. Establishment of Enterprise Credit Scheme, ECS. Mr. Speaker, we would like to emphasize that the ultimate solution to the job creation lies with the private sector. The private sector in Ghana continues to borrow at over 25%, while their competitors elsewhere are borrowing at at least 25%. One way to support them is to ensure a reasonable level of lending rates. Mr. Speaker, government is therefore working together with the banking community to launch a two billion credit and guarantee scheme in 2020. This initiative will be structured to incentivize banks to lend to private sector at discounted lending rates. The scheme, which will start in the first quarter of 2020, will be targeted at specific industries such as agribusiness, manufacturing, hospitality, and tourism, and the tech sector, among others, with entrepreneurs. Promotion of micro businesses and household lending. Government will partner with fintech companies, local banks, and mobile money operators to deliver microcredit to Ghanaian businesses and individuals. This intervention is expected to deliver quick loans to favor on favorable terms using technology-driven platforms to do the credit assessment. This initiative is in line with government's digitalization agenda and offers an opportunity for MSMEs to apply for loans on their mobile phones with minimal human intervention. The initiative will go live in the first quarter of 2020. The benefits of this intervention includes the provision of needed micro capital for business expansion and capital expenditure. It will also support the working capital needs of small Ghanaian businesses. Our market women will be able to assess credit using their mobile money wallets to stock up goods in order to sell more. The initiative is expected to increase productivity and profitability as well as contribute to job creation. This is in direct response to our findings from our nationwide survey. To encourage the establishment of private equity, venture capital, and mutual funds, 
which will improve the ecosystem for startups. The current application of VAT or management fees for these funds will be abolished. As this discourages institutional and angel investors, both local and foreign, from investing in such critical funds for private sector growth. This will improve the accumulation of long-term funds in the economy to support growth and jobs. National Development Bank. Mr. Speaker, feasibility study for the establishment of National Development Bank specifying the rationale mandate business model, legal and regulatory framework, ownership, governance, and sustainability of the bank has been completed. Government is working with the World Bank and other development partners to capitalize the bank in early 2020 for it to commence operations. The National Development Bank, as envisioned, will refinance credit to industry and agriculture as a wholesale bank and also provide guarantee instruments to encourage universal banks to lend to these specific sectors of the economy. The National Development Bank will be an independent institution with strong corporate governance framework and will be globally rated to enable it leverage foreign private capital for industrial and agricultural development in the country. The government will also provide periodic dedicated transfer intervention in key areas of the economy, such as large-scale agro-processing, housing, through various schemes and funds as needed for economic and social development and jobs. It is expected, Mr. Speaker, that the National Development Bank will provide cheaper and long-term funding for the growth and expansion of key companies operating in the agri and industry sectors. The Development Bank will also lend through specialized banks to key anchor industries at the metropolitan, metropolis, and district assembly level to support the government's 1D, 1F initiative. Mr. Speaker, the implementation of the free senior high school policy, which provides opportunities for Ghanaian youth to gain access to secondary education, has recorded significant enrollment numbers since its inception. The total benefit number of beneficiaries for the two cohorts has almost doubled from 400,000 in 2017 to 794,899 students at the end of 2018-19 academic year. And it is projected to increase to 1.264 million in 2020. Mr. Speaker, Government will continue to invest in the education sector by providing adequate infrastructure, improving appropriate regulatory systems, and incessantly building the capacity of teachers across the country to enhance quality human capacity development. We will fast, we will fast track the construction. We will fast track the construction of about 960 structures, including classroom blocks dormitories and auxiliary facilities in secondary schools across the country to ease congestion in our schools. Our other focus is on the expansion Mr. Speaker, our other focus is on the expansion and upgrading of public tertiary institutions to absorb the high growth in student numbers. True to our commitment to prioritizing technical education, this week work has begun on the most comprehensive expansion and retooling exercise ever undertaken in this country's history involving technical institutions. The previous government had negotiated a contract with AVIC International Holdings, which we took over and completely renegotiated to gain greater value for money, getting more for even less money. The contract is to build state-of-the-art training workshops for 15 institutions and a technical examination unit equipped with sets of laboratory equipment for electrical and electronic laboratory, mechanical engineering laboratory, civil engineering laboratory, automotive repair engineering laboratory, and welding equipment laboratory. Mr. Speaker, in line of our commitment to giving value for money, I'm happy to announce that the contract sum has dropped from 119 million US dollars 
to 105 million, representing a savings of $14 million. Furthermore, our negotiations have led to the number of polytechnics to benefit increasing from five polytechnics to 10 technical universities slash polytechnics. Again, the number of technical institutions development and gender. The government has therefore developed a strategy to address this situation and to increase our tax to GDP ratio. Mr. Speaker, the higher public investment in human capital infrastructure that increase domestic revenue will help us finance the building blocks. But we are the first to recognize that for the private sector, both domestic and foreign, to invest and sustain their investment in Ghana economy, there is need to improve business environment, and we will continue to work on this and offer the critical support needed for the private sector to achieve and thrive. Mr. Speaker, to this end, government has introduced the Business Regulatory Reform Program, which is a three-year program initiative that Ministry of Trade and GIPC will support. Mr. Speaker, according to the BOG and BOP records, FDI flows into Ghana from 2016 and 2018 average 2.9 billion a year. As a percentage of GDP, this equates to around 5%. I have no doubt that Ghana is well positioned to become the number one destination for FDI flows in the medium to long term for a host of reasons, including its location, literacy rate, English language, rule of law, strong macroeconomic fundamentals, stable and peaceful democracy, warm climate, and warm hospitality. Added to this, Mr. Speaker, is the choice of Ghana to host the Secretariat of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mr. Speaker, as such, we are putting together a comprehensive strategy to harness and attract FDI to help accelerate growth. We believe that if we can double every year for the next 10 years, it shall translate into increase in GDP growth of over current GDP projection of approximately an additional 6% annually over the medium term. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to announce that the government has approved the formation of an interministerial committee, including the Ministry of Agriculture, the Minister of Trade and Industry, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, and the Ministry of Finance to provide policy guidance for the FDI agenda. Mr. Speaker, in fact, we are already beginning to leverage our advantage to generate a lot of interest in Ghana from global multinational companies. We have so far attracted investment and commercial interest from global automotive companies, including Toyota, Volkswagen, Nissan, Renault, Hyundai, Sinotrack, and Suzuki. Mr. Speaker, various strategic partnerships are also being forged. The Africa Investment Forum, Compact of Africa, the U.S. Prosper Africa, the U.K. Ghana Business Council, the EU Africa Business, China's FOCAC, Japan's TCAD, Korea's QAFAC, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and Singapore, among others. Mr. Speaker, all these measures on the business regulatory environment and the FBI agenda are part of a broader, ambitious strategy to make Ghana a gateway to business in Africa business, financial, and logistics hub in the region. Mr. Speaker, for government, one of the cardinal principles in our economic transformation is to leverage technology wherever possible to innovate. There is no doubt that government in partnership with the private sector is on the right path toward digitizing government services to expedite delivery of services improve the life of citizens, and promote a supportive environment. We have therefore, since 2017, sought to formalize the Ghanaian society by leveraging technology and digitization to improve administrative systems and increase transparency. Mr. Speaker, please permit me to list the following. The introduction of the national ID card is a game changer. On di digital 
property addressing, the process of tagging all 4 million houses with digital addresses is ongoing. Introduction of people as post systems. Driver's licenses and vehicle registration have been digitized. Mobile money payments interoperability has been implemented. The Registrar General Department has been digitized. Password applications are online and together with the national ID cards are eliminating the falsification of records and multiple identities. Renewal of NHIS registration via mobile phone has been a phenomenal innovation. Drones and decentralized delivery of health services. Ghana has joined Rwanda in using drones to deliver critical medical products. Land digitization of blockchain technology. These innovations are intended to improve the overall platform and the ways and means by which citizen businesses and the public sector conduct their activities. Citizen to citizen, business to, bus to citizen, government to citizen, and vice versa. Mr. Speaker, there are substantial benefits in all these measures for good governance and for sound management of the economy. Building these types of information infrastructure will also help expand the tax base of the economy to improve domestic revenue mobilization, a key pillar of Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. Mr. Speaker, soon our national life will be infused with current technology spanning national identification, digital postal, e-banking, link passport, driver's license, pension and insurance data, digital land registratory, mobile money interoperability systems, among others. We have set a digitalization agenda to improve the efficiency of many government agencies. These initiatives will potential long-term gains by leveraging technology to improve transparency and accountability. Mr. Speaker, this is the way to go for Ghana if we are to catch up with the rest of the developed world in the fourth industrial revolution. Ghana is ready and pushing hard on this path. Ultimately, our goal is to become the leading hub in ICT innovation in Africa. Mr. Speaker, in pursuit of this, government will set up a national digital strategy team under the overall oversight of the presidency who will bring together local technology firms and experts and with the professional and financial support from the Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Finance, and the Ghana Investment Promotion Center to elevate the profile and reach of our digitalization strategy across the region to unlock the unexplored economic value of the sector. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurship. Government will accelerate entrepreneurship and MSC growth to support economic growth and dynamism. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurship support programs such as MBSSI and NIIP. In addition, government will facilitate linkage between domestic entrepreneurs and FDI firms to join global value chains. Mr. Speaker, recent studies conducted by the World Bank Group indicates that 200 million people worldwide disproportionately the youth are unemployed and looking for jobs. 600 million new jobs are needed globally over the next 15 years to keep employment rates stable. And 1 billion young people will enter the labor market between 2019 and 2030. The creation of jobs and connecting to markets, as well as building capabilities and connecting workers to jobs, are policy drivers for our TVET program. Mr. Speaker. Government will, over the medium term, establish 32 new state-of-the-art TVET institutions across the country to ensure that our youth are ready for the job market. Accelerated infrastructure development. Mr. Speaker, infrastructure development is a long-term commitment which requires long-term finance. We will aggressively pursue blended financing arrangements, leveraging sources from various development partners, philanthropic, private sector actors, to finance mega infrastructure projects, seaport and airports to position Ghana as a regional logistic hub, road network in the country, metro and light rail transit systems in Accra and Kumasi. Science and technology. Mr. Speaker, the foundation for industrialization is science and technology. Technological capability is a differentiator between developed countries and developing countries. 
Mr. Speaker, towards this objective, Mercy will establish the DGMC to ensure that our technology is up to speed with first world public service delivery. To achieve the delivery of these reforms and initiatives, government will also improve the efficiency of the public service delivery by strengthening automation of administrative services, enhance capacity for service delivery, and support digitization of government's operation, including digital record keeping. Mr. Speaker, conclusion. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, many children, Mr. Speaker, and vulnerable others with no work and no income. This government has thankfully extended the LEAP program for over 150,000 people. Many children went hungry at school, and thankfully we have expanded the school feeding program by 500,000 people. Thousands of our soldiers deployed for peacekeeping were not going to have the kind of motivation they needed, and peacekeeping allowance have been expanded from $31 a day to $35 per day. Tens of thousands of individuals were going to be taxed out of business with nuisance taxes, and these were abolished. While the average annual increase in electricity between 2010 and 2015 was 45 percent, there has been a net reduction in electricity tariffs. Thousands of pensions with disability have had their allocations from District Assembly Common Fund increased by 50 percent. We have also ensured the implementation of our pledge of employing 50% of the persons who manage the country's toll bridges. To address the problem of lack of ambulances, the speaker, 307 well-equipped ambulances for the National Ambulance Service under one constituency, one ambulance initiative, has occurred. By these interventions, Mr. Speaker, we have put monies either directly or indirectly into the pockets of many Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, from 2017 to date, these interventions by government have put at least 12.2 billion in the pockets of Ghanaians. Specifically, three SHS has saved parents a total of 1.8 billion Ghana cities over the last three years, and that's money in their pockets. Planting for food and jobs has saved farmers a total of 844 million cities over the last four, three years for satisfied fertilizer and this is money in their pocket. A total of 357 million have been put into the pockets of teacher trainees within the last three years in the form allowances, and this is money in their pockets. A total of 336 million Ghana cities have been put into the pockets of nursing trainees within the last three years in the form of allowances, and this is money in their pocket. Subsidy for BEC registration fee has saved parents a total of 65 million Ghana cities over the last two years, and that is money in their pockets. The electricity tariff reduction affected by Pura's effective March 15, 2018, resulted in savings of 1.8 billion for a year for residential and non-residential customers, and this is money in their pockets. The reduction and abolition of taxes, including the 50% reduction in import duty, has saved taxpayers a total of 4.1 billion over the last three years, and this is money in their pockets. There are over 350,000 jobs that have been created in the public sector, including 100,000 NAPU graduates, has provided total earnings to them of 2.9 billion Ghana cities, and that's money in their pockets. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the question that should be asked is, what social interventions Mr. Speaker, the question that should be asked is what social interventions did the NDC implement in their eight years in office to reduce the suffering of Ghanaians? Mr. Speaker, we should also not forget that government has, through the financial sector cleanup, saved the deposits of 4.6 million depositors who would otherwise have lost their deposits. Mr. Speaker, 
Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, who together produce 67% of the world cocoa, have agreed on a framework for setting floor prices for cocoa. This is a game changer in the cocoa industry and will result in a major transformation in the fortunes of cocoa farmers from October 2020. They will receive higher prices for their cocoa through the living income differential. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker furthermore, the government of Nana Akufuado campaigned on building a more inclusive society where every community has equal opportunity in getting access to basic infrastructure and services like water, toilets, markets, education, and health. This is the rationale behind the launching of the IPEP initiative. Mr. Speaker, the results the last three years have been impressive, with thousands of projects, some completed and some ongoing across the 275 constituencies. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to announce that preparations are now complete and the construction of the first 600-bed Kaya Year Hostel will commence in Abogloshi next month to provide accommodation and skill training to these vulnerable young women. Mr. Speaker, to address the inclusion of inner city and Zongo communities, the President established a Ministry of Inner City and Zongo Development as well as the Zongo Development Fund. Many project interventions have been made in the last two years. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. We are all witness to the success of our food, of our planting for food and jobs program. We have between 2007 and 2018 a total subsidy in the form of 12,000 metric tons of organic and 821,000 metric tons of blended and government fertilizer, as well as 24,000 metric tons of improved seed valued at 0.6 billion CDs were provided to about 1.9 million farmers. Mr. Speaker, government's industrial development agenda is anchored on the One District, One Factory Initiative, a program designed to support the private sector to establish at least one industrial enterprise in each of the two city districts. Much has been achieved, and we are on to the last 150 to work on. To date, 181 projects are at various levels of implementation spread over 110 districts. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, this August House therefore approved the following tax incentives to the private sector business promoters. Five years corporate tax holiday for one year on companies exempting from import duties, taxes, and levels on equipment, machinery, and parts, exemption from payment of duties and levies on raw materials. Mr. Speaker, beyond 1D1F, the Strategic Under Industries Initiative is one of the key components of our industrial transformation plan to diversify our economy. The key strategic industries under the initiative are petrochemical, aluminum and bauxite, iron and steel, vehicle assembly, automotive industry, garment and textiles, pharmaceutical, vegetable oils and fats, industrial starch from cassava, industrial chemical base or industrial soil, machinery and equipment manufacturing. Mr. Speaker, the introduction of mobile money payments and interoperability between different telcos as well as between mobile wallets and bank accounts has been implemented. This is a major step to financial inclusion and movement towards cashless payment for government services from next year. The interoperability between mobile wallets and bank accounts that we have implemented in Ghana is the first of its kind in Africa and practically provides all 34.5 million mobile money account holders a branchless bank account. This is real change. Mr. Speaker, 
the process of registering businesses has also been simplified and digitized. Mr. Speaker, the judge has also introduced in the courts through the implementation of an electronic justice system that allows the automated serving of court processes with speed and ease. Mr. Speaker, the introduction of the popular court system has reduced the time to clear goods. Mr. Speaker, for the first time ever, through the collaboratory efforts of different agencies, particularly BRI of CSIR, our government launched a comprehensive building code for Ghana in 2018, which is available online at the Ghana Standards Authority website. This will enhance standardization, quality, and reduce cost. Mr. Speaker, to, de to, depend, to deepen and decentralize governance and enhance peace, we have created six new regions. We are proceeding with a referendum and some other amendments to elect MMDCs. We have settled the long-running chief transit dispute in Dagon. We have appointed a special prosecutor for corruption, and we have passed into law the right to information bill, which has been on the radar for the last 20 years. Mr. Speaker, any objective observer will agree that this is that this is a remarkable set of achievements in just under three years. However, there's still more to be done. Today, the cry everywhere is everywhere is about the poor state of our roads. It is an unprecedented cry, and it makes you wonder where all the roads in the NDC Green Group are. Mr. Speaker, this is why we are going to focus more on fixing our roads across the country in 2020 and beyond to get the road sector moving and contractors back to work. Mr. Speaker, to get the road sector moving and contractors back to work, government will pay 80% of all contractors. Mr. Speaker, we have identified critical roads across each of the city regions and construction will begin on all these critical roads. Coco Board has also secured funds to continue ongoing and new Coco Roads. Work on these roads will also commence soon. As part of our new initiative to complement the traditional execution of road projects, we have launched, Mr. Speaker, the Accelerated Community Road Improvement Initiative. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, the 48th Engineers Regiment of the Ghana Armed Forces has started work in Sowutuom and were able, Mr. Speaker, within a day to do over four kilometers of road. Mr. Speaker, the first phase of the Sano Hydro Arrangement is passing for over 150 other roads nationwide. Mr. Speaker, Ghanaians want action on our roads, not words or plans, but what has been done. We intend to swing into action and the work has already begun so that the talking will cease. Mr. Speaker, with this large number of roads to be constructed, the year 2020 can aptly be described as the year of roads, along with a focus on all ongoing flagship projects. Mr. Speaker, it is clear from the foregoing that the government of Nana Adudanko Akufuad has worked hard over the last three years to deliver a substantial number of remarkable achievements which we are going to consolidate going forward. By way of summary and emphasis, I would like to mention some of these achievements. Mr. Speaker, in the last 32 months, we have doubled the rate of economic growth to make Ghana one of the fastest growing economies in the world. We have expanded food production to make Ghana self-sufficient in maize production through planting for food and jobs. We have also introduced and implemented rain for food and jobs to develop the livestock industry. Together with Cote d'Ivoire, we have reached a landmark agreement to have a floor price for cocoa and an extra $400 per ton. 
we have passed a fiscal responsibility act to entrench fiscal discipline. We have reduced a fiscal deficit. We have established a fiscal council. We have issued a euro bond with the largest tenor issuance, least cost, the largest subscription. We have reduced, we have reduced, we have reduced the rate of debt accumulation. We have reduced the overall tax burden on Ghanaians. We have reduced benchmark values by 50%. We have reduced inflation to its lowest in 27 years. We have reduced bank lending rates. We have cleaned up the mess we inherited in the financial sector. We have saved the deposit of some 4.6 million depositors. We have established a financial stability council. We have attained a straight surplus for the first time in our over 20 years. We have reduced our current account deficits. We have increased Ghana's import cover of larger foreign exchange reserves. We have reduced the rate of depreciation of the city. Under our watch, Ghana has become the top destination for foreign direct investment. We have, Mr. Speaker, we have successfully exited the IMF program that we inherited from the NDC. We have improved Ghana's sovereign credit rating with the first rating upgrade in more than a decade. We have doubled capitalization grant. We have expanded a school feeding program. We have expanded LEAP. We have established a nation builder score and recruited 100,000 graduates. We have purchased 567 vehicles and three helicopters for the police. We have launched a nationwide emergency 112 number for the police. We have implemented a new basic curriculum for kindergarten to primary six. We have redefined basic education. We have redefined basic education to include senior high school and technical school. We are absorbing the cost of fossil registration fees for students. We have restored teacher training allowance. We have procured ambulances for all constituencies. We are constructing turf use centers. We've established 75 greenhouses at Darwinia. Mr. Speaker, through our private public partnership with Novartis, government is offering the drug hydrozuria to relieve the pain and suffering of sickle cell patients in Ghana. This is the first such initiative in Africa. We have increased the DACF to persons with disability by 50%. We have established the first government adult shelter to support victims of human trafficking. We have increased peace speaking allowances. We have established and implemented the National Entrepreneur and Innovation Program. We have established a Dongo Development Fund. We have brought transparency in the allocation of oil blocks. We have established and funded the Office of the Special Prosecutor. We have passed the Rice Information Act. Ghana has been elected. Ghana, Mr. Speaker, has been elected to host the Secretariat of the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement. We have established the three development authorities. Mr. Speaker, we have implemented mobile money interoperability. We have introduced a digital alliance. We have introduced online renewal of NHIS registration. Our possible processes are being automated. Well we have implemented an e-procurement at a public procurement authority. Mr. Speaker, we have on course to establish a vibrant domestic automotive industry. The Accra Tama railway line is now in operation, and the Kodukrum, Takwa, and Achimota and Sawam lines have also been rehabilitated. We launched the year of return to mark the 400th anniversary of the first slave taken from Africa to the Americas. It has resulted in increased tourism. We are constructing a dry bulk jetty as well as a multi-purpose container terminal at Takrade. The construction, Mr. Speaker, of Tamale Airport Phase 2 has started. Tamale Interchange is being constructed. Pukwasi Interchange is being constructed. Tama Motorway Interchange is being constructed. Ubecha Bilamte Interchange is being constructed. We have commenced airline operations to work. We have revived Uncle Atlanti and put more people to work. We have commenced the journey to build the National Cathedral. We have established social partnerships. 
We have launched a comprehensive building tour for Ghana for the first time. Let's not speak. Mr. Speaker, finally, we have implemented a free senior high school education for all Ghanaians. As we can all testify, Mr. Speaker, the last three years has been remarkable. And we are grateful to God and the good citizens of Ghana for what we have achieved. Going forward, we will consolidate against me and pursue our transformation at Ghana, so help our God. Yes, Mr. Speaker. As we push, Mr. Speaker, as we push on in the knowledge, as we push on, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as we push on in the knowledge that Ghanaians will know that we mean well, we do well, and that by the grace of the Almighty, we shall all proclaim with loud, one loud voice in melodic unison that one good term of Akuswadu will deserve another. One good term will deserve another term. One good term who deserve another term. Mr. Speaker, the Lord has indeed laid the foundation. The Lord has indeed laid the foundation for our country, and Mr. Speaker, his hands will complete it. The way forward, Mr. Speaker, requires bold and courageous leadership, and this government has exhibited such metal. Mr. Speaker, the boldness of the free SHS program, the boldness of the banking sector reform, the boldness of the renegotiation of the energy sector, the new Ghana Ivory Coast declared floor price for cocoa, the boldness of the termination of the PDS contract, and the boldness of the Fishnet Responsibility Act. My fellow Ghanaians, my fellow Ghanaians, we must. My fellow Ghanaians, we must, my fellow Ghanaians, we must go forth together. Let us break, fellow Ghanaians, this unity and poverty with a rod of iron. Let us go forward with a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Mr. Speaker, we are all growing old. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are all growing old, indeed, Mr. Speaker, and even, and even I, Mr. Speaker, even I turned 60, <laughs> even I, and we need to shout for joy to the Lord, yeah, for the Lord is good 
and his love endures forever. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what was remarkable for me on that day was when I met Dr. Ajepon Yamwa, who told me, Mr. Speaker, about his granddaughter who had just won, Mr. Speaker, who had just won the Queen's Commonwealth Community Essay, Mr. Speaker. So I went, and Mr. Speaker, she had written a poem. We said, this is a, this is, Mr. Speaker, this is a 12 year old. Ghana, Ghana, I am connected to you indeed. Mr. Speaker, and this is what she said. Ever since we gained independence, we have been proud. We have been happy. We have been well mannered. We are noble citizens. I am proud of my homeland. I am proud of my motherland, Ghana. We face neither to the east or north, but we face four. Mr. Speaker, this is a 12 year old who faith and hope in our country. Mr. Speaker, this is a 12 year old who faith in our country. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we need to move forward together and break the disunity and poverty of a rod of iron. Mr. Speaker, we need to build a consensus on a wide web of issues so there's optimism in the future, there's social mobility for all, and a new center of trust. Mr. Chiha, this 2020 budget, this 2020 budget, Mr. Speaker, assures us of a stable and peaceful year in which there are no new taxes. Our roads will be built. We shall strengthen partnership with labor. Employers and faith-based organizations will be our partners. Lending rates will come down. The National Development Bank and the Enterprise Credit System will finance industry, businesses, mortgages, and entrepreneurs. We shall indeed consolidate the gains for growth, jobs, and prosperity for all. Mr. Speaker, let us all rise and build together. Mr. Speaker, I submit to you, Mr. Speaker, the in Poswar and in Kaboom. I submit to you, Mr. Speaker, the in Poswar and in Kaboom budget. Mr. Speaker, Please avoid anything that is non-parliamentary. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I submit to you the Inkosuo and Inkobum budget. A country united in one direction. God bless us all. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Right Reverend, right Honorable Speaker, I so move.